Like, I really believe that we have to be better at becoming self-aware and body aware. So you start to recognize the subtleties of your emotional charges, or you start to recognize like when your body's talking to you, meaning it's giving you a symptom, you're actually paying attention to like what that symptom is tied to. Hi, welcome to Our Power is Within podcast, a podcast here to inspire you to take your power back, to realize that you are the healer that you have been looking for all along. I believe that we are all capable of healing in mind, in body, and in soul. I'm back. Yay. I can't say how I'm back or in what capacity I'm back or how often I'll be back, but I'm back right now, which is so exciting. I'm going to get into introducing our guest today in just a minute, but I feel like I want to at least share a little update on what my season has been like since I did take a step back from the podcast, which created more space and time in my life to pursue other endeavors. I've really, for those of you who've been listening for a long time now, you're probably familiar with the term human design and you know I've talked about it several times. And I've been really focused for me on following my design, specifically my strategy and authority for decision making and leaning into what feels really juicy and satisfying because I am a generator and generators are here to follow their satisfaction and do things and spend their time and energy in ways that really lights them up. So this has been a process, like a real process of me having to try things on and experiment and see what feels good and see what feels juicy and see what leaves me feeling energized or what leaves me feeling depleted and really getting clear about my no's. No to the things that I'm doing because I quote unquote should do them or feel a pressure to get them done or feel like I need to have it done. It's been really eye-opening and it's been fun. What's been really helpful too is I've been following this book. It's a 12-week guide called The Artist Way with a friend. So we've had weekly check-ins as an accountability partners. And I do feel that's been really helpful because part of this guide book is to go and take yourself out on an artist state is what they call it every week. And so I can have a tendency to get really stuck into homebody mentality. I mean, I'm sure many of you can relate after you're so used to staying home all the time because you never know how you're going to feel. It can become a pattern. And so these artist dates have really challenged me to reconnect and, like I said, experiment with what's satisfying and put myself out there. And it's been interesting because I've even caught myself like, oh, well, I should take this pottery class. But then it was like, well, I'm not really excited about it. And there's nothing in me that feels energized about it. So maybe I'll just go do something different instead that feels really exciting. But the point of the date is that it's really inspiring me to get out of the house and do things and play and tap into my inner creative child and my playful being. I've been doing a lot of writing little ditties, like little poems and doing little sketches. In my past, I've always been so hard on myself and the old perfectionist tendencies to not write or draw anything if it's not going to be worthy of sharing. So I've eliminated that entire bulk of pressure where it was like, I am not sharing any of this and it doesn't have to be amazing at all. It can absolutely suck. It's about the process and flexing this creative muscle that has been begging to be unleashed. And it's been fun. It's been real fun. So been doing that. What else? I've been really consistent with exercise. I finally made a decision that I wasn't going to accept anything less anymore from my life because exercise and being an athlete has always been such an important part of my true inner nature and inner being. And I felt this disconnect and I had to really look at how I was maybe still doing too much And that was leading to the term I don't particularly like to use, aka setbacks in quotes. So I've really had to just come to grips with, I 
I'm not putting my pressure on myself with exercise either, but I am going to show up consistently every day and do again what feels really satisfying. And as long as it's fun and I'm satisfied and it feels engaging and I look forward to it. And some days maybe I don't do as much, but I have been really consistent. So that's been really awesome. So yeah, in a nutshell, I have been consistently incorporating some form of exercise and movement beyond just walks. I have been incorporating some type of creative outlets like sketching and doodling and writing little ditties and just really also practicing pause. I know that that's what's next. That's like the big next step for me is pausing more, less time with that little device in my hands less time staring at that screen, less time taking input in so that I can focus on the creative expression outward. So that's the big next step for me. I would love to hear where you're at. I would love to hear what you've been up to, what has been going well for you, what might be your next big step. As we all know, sometimes we can feel really alone on this journey. And so I love connecting so that I don't feel alone. And I love hearing from you guys. And I never want anyone out there who's listening to ever feel alone because I'm always here. So reach out anytime, anyway, and share with me where you're at. I would love to hear it. Now that I just rambled on and talked about myself for six freaking minutes, (laughs) let's get into our guest today. I'll introduce you to Dr. Elvin DeLeon. Dr. Elvin is awesome, plain and simple. In my opinion, he is so incredibly well-spoken. He's easy to understand and he can make things that feel complicated make so much sense in a really simple way. He's clearly passionate about what he does, and it shows in how he communicates and expresses, even in this episode, which you will hear in his voice. (laughs) Classically trained in chiropractic, Dr. Elvin learned about GNM and the five biological laws and how there is an emotional component to our physical symptoms over 15 years ago. And he immediately began implementing this wisdom into his practice and how it impacted how he supported his clients along the way in their healing journeys. So if you go to www.learninggnm.com, you'll actually see a ton of case studies and a large majority of those are actually from Dr. Alvin, which I think is really cool. He hosts regular free webinars that I find to be incredibly insightful and informative. Each one is usually focusing on a different symptom expression. This is something I listened to and I just knew I needed to get to interview him and have him on the podcast for you guys. So if you're interested in learning more about those webinars, make sure you follow him on Instagram so that you can get the latest information on future webinars. I had a blast. I had such a blast chatting with him and I feel like he left us with so much valuable insights to breathe in and let simmer. So please enjoy. All right, Alvin. Yes. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Okay. Thanks for having me, Chess. <laughs> of course. I'm thinking to start out for anybody who might not be familiar with you and your work. Maybe you could just start by briefly explaining a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Awesome. My name is Alvin DeLeon. I'm uh, trained as a chiropractor. I've been in chiropractic practice probably since 2002. And in the first seven years of my practice, I was involved in conventional chiropractic work working with sports teams, athletes, and then got my fellowship in pediatrics. So I started working with pregnant women and children, and then it evolved into energy medicine and things like body talk, total body modification, tongue end therapy. So I was into all of that world. And then it was around 2008, 2009 that I got introduced to German new medicine and GNM and kind of the focus of what we do, what I've been doing in the last 15 years now, and, and maybe the focus of this 
conversation. So learning about GNM really changed and transformed my entire perspective on health, symptoms, the body, and it really transformed my practice and my life, really, in terms of how I live day to day and how I've been able to help people mostly now working through the GNM model of helping them understand the emotional component of their symptoms and doing a lot of this work really online. That is awesome. I didn't know you were a chiropractor. So do you still adjust people ever? Yeah, I'm actually in the clinic a couple of times, like twice a week now. And a lot of, again, it depends on the symptoms. Like I think 90, 95% of the people I see are now very much GNM based. And if that involves physical symptoms, once we figure out the emotional component, then I go through my chiropractic assessment and we go through our chiropractic treatment. So yes, I'm still doing adjustments depending on what it is coming in for. Okay. I like this. I already like where this is going. So it's interesting because I've heard people say, oh, you don't need chiropractic. You don't need acupuncture. You don't need these things. But here you are with 15 years experience in German new medicine. You have so many testimonials and case studies on the GNM website. And you still have found a way that something like a manual adjustments to somebody can still support them, even though you know there's a psycho-emotional component. Well, yes. So to a degree, everyone is saying regarding the emotional component, once you understand it, it will have a physiological response or trigger a physiological response in the body, such as reduction in, in swelling, such as relaxation of the muscles, which will contribute to them feeling better. So just so that people understand that in its purity, right? You knowing what this symptom is about emotionally and you being able to understand that, change the way you look at it so that you no longer are emotionally triggered, that should actually help the most in terms of minimizing any kind of physical discomfort or relief from the symptom. Now, obviously, in certain cases, things are different, right? Like you said, there could be a hang healing, there could be a hanging conflict. There could be many tracks or triggers. And then you also have to factor in the reality of the situation. And this is an important thing for people to keep in mind as you learn about GNM. There is no treatment protocol per se in GNM, whereas most treatments, you're given a diagnosis and everybody that has this diagnosis, they enter this treatment protocol. And within this treatment protocol, everybody gets the same treatment. And a certain percentage of people after a period of time will be asymptomatic. So we could come up with what's considered a success rate of that treatment protocol for this condition. And as you can imagine, that's the model that many of us kind of raised on, right? And so we kind of bring that model and perspective into GNM as we learn this new paradigm. And it doesn't quite work the same, right? Because for example, we're able to recognize that your chronic digestive issues, let's say your IBS diagnosis, Crohn's diagnosis, you become aware that it's tied to the fact that your brother has cut you off for the last seven years and wants nothing to do with you. And in your mind, it was unexpected and it's hard to digest, right? You cannot accept the fact that your brother just cut you off seemingly for no reason and doesn't want you in in their life. And that issue that's hard to digest, it's what's triggering your digestive issues, your Crohn's irritable bowel symptoms. Now that you recognize that after we have a GNM consultation, the options to resolve it is, okay, Can you forgive and forget and reconcile with your brother and everything's going to be fine now? Or can you move on with your life, never having your brother in it and being totally fine with your brother not being in your life? Now, if you tell me that that's going to be difficult to do, I cannot just forgive and forget and reconcile and I cannot just move on. Well, then does that mean that GNM has a bad success rate for IBS or Crohn's? So do you see how... It doesn't work that way because everything is so particular and specific and personal that some people will say they're digestive issues because of my boss at work who's bullying me. Oh, that makes sense. I don't need that job. I'm going to quit that job and find a new job or start my own business. So then if that's the cause of your Crohn's or IBS, does that mean GNM has a high success rate for that person? For You see how we have to reframe our entire perspective of quote unquote success rates and treatment protocols. Because in GNM, it's very personal. Some of these conflict issues are very straightforward and they're very simple for us to resolve and move on from. And those are the people that get tremendous results. Some of them 
It could be that your conflict is because of your partner who cheated on you three years ago and you're trying to make the marriage work. Well, guess what? That means there's going to be triggers in that marriage and it's not going to be so easy to just close that issue. Well, then those symptoms may linger and that may keep you in a hanging healing. So again, when you understand this, now you look at, okay, well, what can support me in this healing? Because I know it's not going to be easy for me to just forgive my partner who cheated on me three years ago, because every time she doesn't reply to my text, every time she shows up late, like I get triggered. Every time we get in a fight, I get triggered. Is she going to cheat on me again? So maybe while I'm working on that, I need support because I feel devalued. I feel lack of support with that incident. I need to see my chiropractor every now and then. I need to go get massage to give me some relief from the flare-ups of these symptoms. And that's where the change has to be, Chaz. This idea that these therapies that are available, these treatment options support us in the healing. They do not heal the body. And that's really the change where maybe a lot of people that are sharing information about GNM they're trying to be very clear that like only your psyche, the conflict started in your psyche, which means the healing can only start at your psyche, not because of that remedy or medication or surgery. But yes, from a GM perspective, if you know that I cannot resolve that issue with my brother, and that's the reason for that growth in your colon, well, then if you can't resolve it, that can't heal, which means you're going to have to potentially have surgery to remove that thing. Right. Until you tell me you can heal that issue with your brother. So that's where it gets a little bit murky, right? There's no clear protocol because everything depends on your story and your ability or willingness to change that story so you can heal. Yeah, I love that. See, you're so well-spoken. You put that so well. And the other thing that I heard you say too, and you're talking about supporting yourself, you know, even maybe say you're having symptoms that show up and they say, you're obviously going through self-devaluation and maybe it takes a while to go all the way back through the layers of where that original DHS was. What if it was when I was five years old and I can't remember right now, you know? So we could downgrade things, but along the way of peeling back layers, you're saying the way you practice supporting people is that you still support alternative treatments to help them through the pain and discomfort of what they're experiencing. Absolutely. absolutely. And and even in that example that you say, right, the one thing I want people to understand that are learning about GNM and they're getting exposed to this paradigm is that when the way you technically apply it, especially in the beginning, and this is just what I've found that helps, right, is that whenever you're dealing with a symptom, so it could be your chronic back issues, the way you apply GNM into your life is you have to ask yourself, when did that start? And so you have to identify like, was it in your teens? Was it in your 20s? Was it in your 30s? When did you first become conscious of this back issue? And then when you identify like, oh, it was first year of college or sometime in the beginning of college, then you have to go back there and and ask yourself, well, during that period of my life, what was unexpected that was going on at that time that could have been distressing for me in that period? So sometimes I find for a lot of people that learn about GNM and they know what the conflict themes are. They know it's a self-devaluation regarding lack of support if it's their back. They know it's an indigestible anger if it's their digestive tract. I find that for a lot of people new to it, we create these filters in our mind. Our ego kind of puts up this wall of say, yeah, yeah, but you didn't feel angry in your college days. So it can't be that or that didn't make you feel devalued. So it can't be that we tend to do this. And those that are most vulnerable, those of us that have done a lot of personal and spiritual growth work, right? We tend to believe that I've put in 15 years of therapy. I've done five years of spiritual exercises to achieve a level of awareness and consciousness. I don't get angry anymore. I don't get scared anymore. So in order to bypass that filter in your mind when you're applying GNM, you look at the chronology, when did the symptoms start? And instead of looking for the specific conflict theme, I look for what was unexpected at that time Mm -hmm. that was distressing. What was unexpected that bothered you? What was unexpected that was annoying, frustrating at that time? You see how those words are very safe for your ego to admit to, right? You're going to say like, well, yeah, that was kind of annoying. I remember that kind of being frustrating. And then when you identify it, then you say, Does that fit a self-devaluation regarding lack of support 
subconscious perspective. Mm -hmm. See, now you can put it together. Because as you can imagine, in 15 years of working with this, I know what that feels like, right? Like I talk to people all the time. I've been studying GNM for three to five years. I can't find this conflict. I don't know. And oftentimes when we talk to them, like we're always able to find it. But it's because we have our own filters that will tell us you're no longer an angry person. You no longer feel you see your value. So you don't feel devalued. That can't be it. And that's what we do. So you kind of bypass those filters by making it number one, unexpected at the time. And number two, a general kind of annoying, frustrating, kind of stressful event at that time. And then when you pick it, because it bypasses your filter, then does that fit the theme that I'm actually experiencing the symptom? So that's kind of a a new process that I've been sharing a lot in some of my webinars that I didn't really talk about many years ago. It's just because I'm starting to notice so many people struggle with finding their DHS. And it's not that it's difficult to find. It's this, they put up these filters against those conflict themes, right? And so just something to be aware for those of you that are maybe not very new, but you're still somewhat in the early stages of studying and implementing GNM in your life. Hey, I'm the one who struggles with that. So I love this already because I can have like a new symptom like a month ago and then be like, I don't know what made me feel angry. I don't know what made me feel like my identity was threatened. I don't know what made me feel alone. <laughs> like, it's funny because I know this stuff and yet I still get tricked all the time where suddenly there's a symptom and then I think, I don't relate to what this symptom is saying is happening in my psyche. So I like this. You're helping us bypass that block, which is true because you know we know a lot of people in this healing community, we know that that there's elements of us that love what's known and familiar, even if what's known and familiar is suffering. And there's parts of us that don't want us to get to these deeper layers because there's change that can happen there and that change can feel scary or can feel threatening. So yeah, I really like that. Absolutely. So something to keep in mind moving forward, even for yourself, Chaz, is like, okay, let me look for when did it start around that time? What was unexpected that was kind of distressing, annoying, frustrating at that time? And then when you pick it, does it fit the cough? Like some scare, does that fit a scare? Okay, I guess subconsciously it could have been a scare. Then you could work through it that way, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I love that so much. I honestly, from my own perspective, just so that anyone who's listening might be able to relate to this, I've even had times where I intuitively like no but I just don't want to admit it. Like there's something that wants to just deny it in me. Like I know it was from this, like I know it inside intuitively, but everything in me is like, no, no, it couldn't have been. No, it couldn't have been. You know, like I want to argue and fight with myself about it. (laughs) Well, that's a good point to highlight, right? This idea that a lot of this search for the original issue, it's not an intellectual process, right? It's not going to be like, let me sift through everything I was dealing with in my first year in college and try to pinpoint it. My suggestion is always, it's more of like an intuitive feel. It's a memory that comes up when you go to that stage of your life. It's something that like, when I work with people, it's more like word association. Like I'm talking a lot and it triggers, like, you know, tell me about this. Okay, what was going on with your family at that time? What was going on with your relationship at that time? And maybe something just comes to them. So You're right. A lot of this process is very intuitive because where your mind will naturally go or where you feel it's going to go, your mind's going to say, yeah, but that wasn't so unexpected. That didn't bother me that much. That was not really such a big deal. Your mind will try to justify why it can't be that. My thing is wherever you first go and then you go somewhere else, it's probably going to end up being where you want it to go. Right. Yeah. Like you said, It was just what that meant to dig that up means there's going to be some work involved. And a lot of people, I mean, it's just a reality, right? Like most of us do not want to necessarily have to dig up our old, painful, difficult memories and have to try to address it at this moment. Right. Yeah. Well, now what's your take on and how do you help somebody through a situation where they literally just do not even remember when the symptoms started showing up? So you're like, oh, well, did it start in college or did it start when you were a teen? And they're like, I don't know. I really just don't know. I'm shut down. Like for whatever reason, I'm having a memory loss or disconnected. I feel like it's been as long as I can remember, but it could have been when I was a kid or could have been a teenager. Like, I just don't know, Alvin. So now what? So my thing usually when people say that, the people that struggle with that are usually people that tell me they've had it their whole life. 
So that's the typical comment, right? Somebody will say like, I've been dealing with this skin rash my whole life. So, okay. So then that's like, I don't know. Like it's been my whole life. So then my next question is usually when was your conscious awareness of the rash? Like if it's been your whole life, like, I don't know, maybe you had it when you were six months old, a year old, who knows? But when did you start to realize that, okay, what the heck is this? Why is my life different? Because I have to see somebody or I have to apply something to my skin. Nobody else is doing that. Like, when did that happen? And then that's often how I would, where I would go, where they became conscious of it, right? Because a lot of times you could have conflicts when you were three, four, five that resolve and then they show up at nine. You have symptoms again at nine, right? But that's because you have a new issue at nine and then that gets resolved. And then you have new symptoms that show up again at 16. Same symptoms though, but you have these gaps. And to imagine if you're now 35 and now it's been full blown since your 20s, it's easy for you to say to me, it's been my whole life. And that's why one of the questions that's in my intake when I work with people is in the 20 years, in the 15 years that you're aware of, consciously aware that this has been there, what's been the longest period of relief? Mm -hmm. So if you tell me, oh, well, actually, I had no skin issues for 10 years. When I was in my early 20s, I had nothing. And then at 30, it showed up. Okay, then I would probably start at in your 30s. Okay, what was going on then? Right? Because again, as you can imagine, whether you know GM or not, life circumstances change that resolve conflict for us without our awareness. We address the issue with that boss or with your brother without knowing that that was going to resolve the issue, which is why your symptoms go away, or you temporarily get distracted that makes your symptom go away. So in my mind, it's always important for people to understand that if there was a big gap, that perhaps we don't have to look so far back. We just have to go to like the recent flare up because then there's a more definitive issue that they will recall. And if we need to, we could then draw a common thread theme throughout their life that whenever they experience this kind of situation in a close relationship, it triggers a separation or fear of separation. So you're able to put it all together that they're vulnerable to that issue with their partner at 30, because when they were 19, this happened with their first boyfriend. When they were 14, their cousin moved away when they were just, so there's been a separation theme that they've been vulnerable to. So then you can now recognize why there is a connection to their childhood but really, this recent flare up is a newer issue that they need to work through. Mm, okay. And yeah, and I've noticed even for myself and like from communicating with other people who are very familiar with GM, it seems as though we almost do have themes that do reoccur. Like mm -hmm. I had something as a child, and that's evidence of my perception in life. And mm -hmm. so then it, is common for me to experience that again and again and again down the road. And possibly as I get older, it maybe is even more prevalent because it's been reinforced so many times. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the way I look at that is you have a certain perspective of the world that you're perhaps born with that's influenced by your childhood, that's influenced by major emotional highs and lows that you've endured. But you have a certain perspective that when things don't go the way you expect them to, this is how you naturally see it, right? And what I will tend to tell people is like, okay, if you recognize that pattern, because that pattern is causing you symptoms, well, that's, again, the symptoms, it's your body's way of communicating with you, right? It's kind of like tapping you in the shoulder saying, hey, Chaz, like every time things don't go the way you expect it to go, every time things are out of order from what you were told, you can't digest it. It makes you angry. So we're going to keep giving you symptoms, which is why you have these digestive issues ever since you were five or ever since you were seven, because that's when you first moved and you didn't like that. And then your parents got divorced and you didn't like that. And then, right. So you start to see the pattern. So now the work is, okay, that's your vulnerability, Chaz. When things don't go, if somebody tells you we're going to do A, B, C, D, and E, and then they're like, no, 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 we're going to switch it. We're going to do A, E, C, D, B. You're going to lose it, right? And I can't digest it. You get angry. So then the work is, okay, how do you recognize that in yourself as a vulnerability that that's just how you see the world? Then you have to go a little bit deeper in terms of what do you associate with the change in that routine? Because it could be as simple as the first time this happened was when your parents got divorced. That's why you moved homes. 
Well, then how can you recognize that every time things don't go the way you expect, it doesn't mean you're going to be separated from the people you care about. See, so that seems like, oh, yeah, it doesn't mean that. So that's a quick way for somebody to just start to shift the perspective, right? So so there's always this recognition of why that pattern exists. That means I have a certain way that I look at the world when things don't go the way I expect. And then why do I look at it like that? What does that mean for me? What am I most afraid of when that happens? And then that's where you need to bring that to the surface so you can change the story or the narrative around that association. And that's ultimately the healing aspect of GNM. That's what's great about it. There's a personal spiritual process that we go through when we heal. Mm -hmm. So we do talk a lot about perspective shifting in GNM. And it sounds so easy, like it would be so easy on the surface, but it's so difficult because I think personally for me, it's sure, it's really easy to shift a perspective at a conscious level. But what we're dealing with is this subconscious pattern. So we can't just shift or decide to think differently consciously. We actually have to be able to connect with that subconscious, that deeper layer of the psyche and shift there. So do you find that you have any tools or modalities that really help people support shifting at that deeper level? Well, it's actually not so far off from what I was just describing earlier. I think the process is your symptoms are revealing your subconscious perspective of unexpected events, right? So you get the symptom that shows up on the surface. That symptom is because this is how you perceive it when things don't go the way you expect, right? So you can't digest it. So that's why you have chronic digestive issues. So before GNM, we did not understand what this meant. We assumed the symptom indicated something was wrong with your colon, your stomach, or your small intestine, okay, or that you were allergic or reacting to foods or to chemicals, right? So we didn't understand the language of the body. GNM comes along and pretty much deciphers the language, gives you like a map that tells you like whenever you get this symptom, it means you perceive the world this way. When you get this symptom, you perceive it this way. So we already technically are getting access to our subconscious perspective based purely on knowing GNM that in GNM, you may think you're not an angry person, Chaz, but whenever somebody says, we're going to go to the movies, we're going to eat ice cream, and then we're going to have dinner. Oh no, we changed it around. We're going to have dinner first, then go to the movies and eat ice cream. You're going to lose your mind and you're going to get upset about that change, right? You may think you're not an angry person, but if while you're having dinner, you got to run to the bathroom, that's already your subconscious saying, hey, I don't like that we changed the plans. That never happens, right? That leads to bad things for us. So now you bring to the surface the subconscious meaning of the symptom. Once you bring that to the surface, you're now conscious of it. You could read a bunch of books. There's a bunch of modalities that you can do to consciously change your perspective. Technically, now that applies. But remember, it will only apply because you understand that this symptom means this, that whenever things get changed in my plans, I can't digest it. It makes me angry. Let me bring that to the surface. Where does that come from? Why do I see it that way? Oh, because when I was six, I had to move away from my friends because my parents got divorced. Oh my gosh. That's what I associate with a change in routine. It's the divorce of my parents and me being taken away from my friends. So now can you change your perspective consciously? Sure. So is you and your partner having dinner instead of going to the movie first? Is that going to lead to your parents getting divorced and you being separated from friends? No. So do you see how the change in perspective is not as difficult as it seems when you understand the underlying meaning of the symptom and know that you're only vulnerable to this because your perspective at five associates this with something negative in your life at five. Mm-hmm. Do you see how, but right now, I don't know, in your thirties, doesn't mean that. Right. So from now on, now that I see this connection, Every time things are out of order, it doesn't mean I'm gonna, my parents are getting divorced and I'm going to be taken away from my friends. That's the perspective shift. But you see how that's happening at a conscious level. And so what your question that you posed makes sense if you don't know the language of GNM. If you don't know that this symptom means this is how you perceive it, you're just working on this symptom as having some subconscious meaning for you. 
If you don't go deeper than that, and it stays at that kind of superficial subconscious level, you need to know that like, no, you never, why do you see it that way? Oh, it's because when I was five, that's what happened. Yeah. Once you know that, then you could very easily say, I'm not five of it anymore. My parents are passed away now. I don't have to worry, but like I, my friends are all around me. I'm not going to move away from my friends if I don't want to. Like now you could consciously address it. So that's the piece where, again, if you're only very superficially dabbling in GM, like it's hard to kind of understand that level that you have to get to. And also, you know, that's more coming from a practical standpoint, right? Like this is the kind of stuff that I work with people on understanding why they feel that way. It's hard to get that from the website, like reading about the content. You're not really going to know like, oh, I have to go a little bit deeper. Like, why is it every time somebody does that? Here's how I respond. Why is it that whenever something goes wrong, I devalue myself? Mm -hmm. Where does that, I get neck pain? Like, where does that come from? And then that's when you could look at so many things in the past as somewhat contributing to why you have the perspective that you have today. And once you become aware of that, you can definitely change that perspective because you're no longer that child or that person. Yeah, it kind of like loses its power in a sense when you Mm -hmm. see it so clearly. You know, in one of your webinars, I think it was the one on the syndrome, you were talking about, and I don't know if it's applicable to just syndrome or all conflicts, but you were talking about there's always a fear and that there's always two fundamental fears, fear of abandonment or fear of death. Is that applicable for all of this? Like if I was to extract and be like, oh, why am I not digesting this sudden change? And it's because of something when I was five, like, is there still those two underlying fears to all of this? Or was that really related just to syndrome? So first of all, that statement, it's more of like a personal observation for me. It's not based on GNM per se, right? Mm -hmm. I've just observed in, again, the years of working with people, you know, when people have anxiety, when people have multitude of different symptoms, you're looking at, okay, what's underneath? What is it that's causing you to feel devalued, causing you to have that separation and, and whatever emotional conflict shock that's triggering the biological program, right? That's at this level. If you go a little bit deeper than that, I just started to observe that most of our fears come down to, I don't want to die and I don't want to be rejected, abandoned and alone, right? And this idea of rejected, abandoned and alone, it's tied to failure, right? Like, because why are we afraid to fail in anything? Fail as a mother, fail as a partner, fail in society, because if I fail, I will be rejected, right? And so that's the key point there. It's not so much that you're alone. Like people say, oh, I'm very comfortable. Yeah, but there's a difference between you choosing to be alone and you being rejected and being kind of kicked out of the tribe, right? Right. So I started to observe that. And again, this is not really part of GNM. This is more my own personal practice and observation that when you really get down to it, people are having symptoms because they're afraid of death, right? Because whatever they're dealing with could lead to death or because they're afraid of rejection, abandonment, and being alone. And as I think about it, I feel that these go back to our tribal cultures when we lived in these tribes, right? Where the worst thing that could happen when you lived in a tribe was getting kicked out of the tribe. And and like, how do you get kicked out of tribe? Well, if you piss off the elders, they can just kick you out. So we have this sense of like, we have to respect authority. We have to follow authority because they can just kick us out of the tribe. We care about what other people think in the tribe. We want everyone in the tribe to like us because if everybody doesn't like us, they can vote us out of the tribe. Right. So we're constantly caring about what people think about us, how they see us. And we're constantly comparing ourselves. Right. Because if you're the worst hunter, you're the worst fisherman, you're the worst gatherer. Well, you're the first one to get kicked out because we don't need you. You're so bad at that role. So we're constantly comparing where do we stand amongst the other hunters, gatherers? Like, uh, where's our status compared to everyone else? So I find that those fears kind of follow us into our current social environment, right? Where we're in right now, we got to follow authority. If you don't follow the rules, you're going to get kicked out, right? Right now, we care what people think. We want people to like us. How many people like this post? How many people shared this post? How many people think I'm doing a good job, right? We care what people think because we don't want them to kick us out. And we're constantly comparing ourselves. How is their life compared to mine? Am I doing pretty good? Am I the worst? Because I don't want to get kicked out. Once people realize that that's at the root 
of a lot of the biological programs from a GNM perspective. So again, this is kind of at a deeper level. You're going to have to realize, like, I have to have a narrative that makes me at peace with the idea of death. So that no longer ha- is a factor in my life. And I have to have a perspective that allows me to realize that we no longer live in tribal cultures, right? Like right now, or back then, if you got kicked out of the tribe, you were on your own. Like no tribe would take you in because I don't know, something must be wrong with you to get kicked out of your tribe. You're not going to poison our tribe, right? Get out of here kind of thing, right? Whereas today, you, Chaz, can take everything that you own, leave everyone that you love and move to a country where you don't know a single human being and don't even know the language and start a whole new life. That happens today. That's called immigration. Like that's what everybody did, right? So once people realize that in the world, I'll never be alone unless I choose to be alone. Like no matter how much I think I'm failing in this aspect of my life, in this role in my life, in the world, I'm never going to be alone. Someone will always be there. People always step up. Like that's also what makes us human, right? It cancels out that fear of rejection and abandonment with this idea that we need to form community. We need to form packs. We want to help people that are lost naturally. So it's almost interesting when you observe this. And again, this is not really a GNM kind of idea. It's just my own observation that like, wow, if we're not scared to die because we're at peace with, you know, why people die when they die. And if you start to recognize from a global perspective that you're never going to be alone in the world, that strangers will show up in your life that will be, have meaningful relationships with you, that will be there to help you when you really need it, then I start to recognize like, what's going to stop you in your life? Like, what's going to cause these conflicts when you understand that these are potentially at a deeper level, the things we're all afraid of? So that's kind of just, you know, you just happen to hear that webinar where I was introducing that idea when it comes to the kidney collecting tubules, right? Which is the idea of abandonment existence conflicts. And so, yes, it definitely applies to that. But I think just in general, whenever you're worrying, whenever you have any kind of anxiety or any kind of fear, if you go deep enough, you're going to look at it like, I'm worrying about this issue because there's a fear it could lead to my death, or I'm worrying about this issue because there's a fear that it could lead to me failing and then me being rejected, which means I'm going to be alone. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really liked it. It really hit home for me. and. From my understanding, the kidney collecting tubules issue conflict is quite common, isn't it? Well, because of, again, yeah, because of that, yeah, we have these tribal fears, right? Yeah. Well, yes, I think it's very easy in today's day and age for people to feel alone, to feel like their life is at stake, to feel like their financial existence is at stake, right? Based on how societies run. So I would say it's very common in the way we currently live now. I don't know if we went and found some natives and indigenous, right, in the forest, if they have the same feeling, yeah. right? Like maybe in their tribe, in their village, in their pack, it's very united and tight and you don't see a lot of, you know, who knows, right? Who yeah. knows? So, but in our culture, definitely, it seems to be something that's quite common. Yeah. Well, and to top it off, in the community that I would say predominantly are my listeners is where it's like a community of people who've been chronically ill, chronically sick, having a lot of symptom expression in their body. And it's very natural to feel very alone in that, right? Like, which mm-hmm. is why they say finding a community is so powerful for healing mm-hmm. because we can feel really alone. We can feel really ununderstood. We're definitely might, you know, be afraid of our death. And then if this can lead to an active kidney collecting tubules conflict, well, now we know that that also puts us at even more risk for more intense symptoms when we experience any other healing phases and makes our healing phases even harder and yeah, more potentially threatening. So I think, I don't know, when I heard you talk about that, it really hit home for me and made a lot of sense and really helped me personally. You gave this beautiful example and we don't have to go into depth into it, but You gave this beautiful example of how if you were to like fast forward and say, I am looking at my life when I'm 90 years old and I'm looking back on my life and like guaranteed no matter what, at least half the people that you've ever encountered will have been your people, would have liked you, would have been a part of your tribe, your crowd. And that for me, I think that's getting into like the fifth biological law, right? Like having this ability to like really shift this like broader quantum perspective. And when I heard you say that something in me really shifted and I was like, oh my God, this is huge for me because now 
here I was getting so sucked into like looking at just this one particular job and how I don't connect with these people at this one job. But like, if I look on a grander scale, I have so many beautiful connections. So it's where I choose to focus. And so that was a really good insight. I think in the webinar you're alluding to, it, it was one way to kind of neutralize the fear of being abandoned, right? Yeah. Like that was the suggestion. And it's not really to do with, the, again, the biological laws is more my own clinical experience that one way to, in order for you to realize that you truly will not be abandoned alone in the world or in the universe is that if you look at this concept of balance, right? The idea that everything in the universe is striving for balance, everything in nature is striving for balance. Well, why shouldn't our relationships be balanced? So that was where I kind of came up with, again, you know, it's one of the things that happened in my consults. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting perspective that came to me. Like, yeah, why shouldn't our friends and our relationships be balanced? Like, yeah. why not by the time you die, half the people you've ever come into contact with are fans of yours, no matter what. And yeah. half, like exactly 50% don't care about you. Some of these people actually hate your guts for yeah. no reason. They don't like your name. They don't like your hair. They don't like what you stand for. They don't like your character. And so if we can imagine that perspective, that no matter what you're doing today, no matter what happens in this decade of your life, because we could have certain decades where you have more fans, other decades, you have more followers, other decades, it's more balanced. If you can imagine that by the time we die, it's going to be 50-50. Like, then it relaxes the fear of failing right now because I, I don't want more people to not like me, right? That whole concept. So yeah, so that's kind of, again, it's just like a strategy that I try to introduce to people. And and I always say that, to be honest, like celebrities, people that we look up to in certain areas, certain arenas, whether it's sports, music, whatever it is, those that get it see this, right? Because they have a big enough circle of people that follow them that they have lots of fans for them to become a celebrity. But that's also when the haters start showing up, right? I don't like the way they dress. I don't like their music. And so the celebrity that understands the balance will always listen respectfully to the criticism of the haters so they can be better for their fans. And that's kind of the way like this kind of evolved for me that I realized that our networks are so small that we feel like 80% of the people we hang out with must like us. And so this idea that like more than 10% or 20% of the people don't like us, like, oh my gosh, how could that be? What can I do to make sure that like 80% of the people like me? And that's why it's an interesting way to kind of, you know, change your perspective around 50-50 being a good thing. 50-50 representing balance, not like academic 50-50, which is like, well, 50% is barely passing. If that, no, no, I want you to look at it from a more balanced state of like yin and yang, right? That it's always for everybody that praises you, somebody is not really supporting you. And that that's going to balance out by the time we die. Right. Yeah. So it's just a different thing, you know, a mental exercise to kind of help people not be concerned about whatever phase of their life that they're in. It helped me a lot. So <laughs> it really awesome. helped me shift a big perspective. Great. So I am wondering, in your opinion, because I kind of briefly mentioned how like something like active syndrome can actually make a healing phase harder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From a GNM perspective, it's not the food or the cigarettes or the alcohol that causes the disease, but it mm-hmm. could definitely aid in the body not being healthy enough to support itself through a healing phase. What are ways that you find are really supportive for people to optimize their body's ability to move through really hard healing phases? Well, so I think the biggest thing that is probably, I mean, again, just my own personal thought, this is not like a GM thing so much as just my own experience, is the self-awareness. Like, I really believe that we have to be better at becoming self-aware and body aware. So you start to recognize the subtleties of your emotional charges, or you start to recognize like when your body's talking to you, meaning it's giving you a symptom, you're actually paying attention to like what that symptom is tied to. So I think that's number one. Like, I think it's important for people to improve upon their body awareness and self-awareness, meaning like you start to recognize and establish your baseline rhythm of like your natural energy and and frequency and rhythm. And you start to pay attention to when that rhythm gets disrupted, that text message, something about that's bothering me, something about that interaction, that comment, something doesn't sit well. Why? 
and then you go a little bit deeper. So, so I think that's important because that allows you to maybe recognize when you get triggered emotionally, what some of the tracks are for people that are dealing with chronic symptoms. And when you enter some healing symptoms, like you're paying attention, like, oh, my body's telling me I have to rest. My body's telling me I have to take time away from this person because I get the symptom whenever we have an argument. Okay, so I have to listen. So that's a big part of it in terms of self-awareness and body awareness. And I really think the, the second other main component is trust. Like, I really believe that in order for you to embody GM, your trust levels have to be at an all time high. You have to be able to trust your body. You have to trust that your body's natural state is to heal, repair, restore, regenerate. That's what it's going to do. Now, there are things that disrupt or delay that natural healing, repair, restore, restoration, and regeneration. Number one is you never resolve the original conflict because if you never resolve the original conflict, you will get triggered constantly about that conflict that delays or disrupts the healing. Number two is you get exposed to new shocks. You get a second shock, a third shock, a fourth shock. So now instead of dealing with one biological program, your body's got to deal with four or five. That's going to delay and disrupt the healing. Or number three, you're in a constant state of stress. You're in a stressful marriage. You're in a stressful financial situation. You're a stressful family situation. Well, being in a constant state of stress will delay and disrupt your natural healing capability. So, but if you remove those things, if you're not under any constant state of stress, if you're not exposing yourself to new shocks and so that your body can heal with the one conflict that it's dealing with, and if you resolve that original conflict, your body's natural state will be to heal. So we have to trust that, that I don't have to teach my body. Nobody has to do anything. I don't have to intervene with anything for my body to heal. Going back to your first statement, right? That technically, if you remove those things, that will happen. As we know, it's not so easy to just resolve those conflicts depending on the circumstances personally that that person has to deal with. So you have to trust your body at a ridiculous level, right? All time high. And then you have to trust yourself that you're going to know what your body wants you to do next. And that's a big piece here because going back to interventions and remedies and you have to know yourself that Again, going back to combining self-awareness with trusting yourself, right? You have to know that I grew up in a home with both my parents are medical doctors and they scared the crap out of me that if I have this condition and I don't take medication or I don't do surgery or I don't do this diagnostic test, I will die. So now that I'm in my 30s and I'm all about natural health and natural healing and everything is good and then, oh, I got that disease that they said, if I don't do this, I'm going to die, right? I don't care how much you know about natural health, natural healing. If you know that that is a vulnerability for you personally, because I learned about natural health and natural healing in the last three years, but for 35 years of my life, I've been exposed to a perspective that if you don't do this, you're going to die from my parents, from society, from the media. Well, then now that I'm dealing with this exact disease that creates the most fear, what does my body want me to do? You have to be able to trust yourself to know what that is, even if ideologically it doesn't match where you'd like to be. Mm. That's the difference right now, right? And that's to me, I mean, I can only speak on that based on my experience, right? Because there's plenty of people that would love to do things in the ideal possible way based on the knowledge they've now recently attained. But they have to match that with, I don't know, 35, 40, sometimes 50 years of a different paradigm that's told them the opposite, that this is dangerous, that if you do nothing, that if you don't do this, and then you have to combine that with not having the support of your loved ones, because that's the third group of trust that you have. You have to be able to trust your pack. You have to be able to trust that there's going to be people that are going to support you in the healing. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, that's why... I have the perspective that we don't know what the right thing is for somebody to do, even when they know GNM. Yeah, right? you're because right. You've been introduced to GNM in the last year, but I don't know, for 30, 40, 50 years of your life, you had a certain perspective of what's happening in the body. Now you're faced with that diagnosis. So you really think you just flip the switch and don't get me wrong, for some people, I'm amazed that they can flip the switch. But that's great for them. For others, it's not so easy. Right. And so this is why I'm not in a position where I give medical advice. 
Like, I don't know what your body needs, Chaz. You're the expert of your body. You got to trust your body. You got to trust yourself. You got to trust that you're going to have a pack of people that are going to support you in that healing. Now, I could be part of that support group. Great. Right. But you've got to make the final call. You've got to see yourself as the expert of your body, even if that means doing something that based on what you've learned, you shouldn't do. But the fear around your life, your upbringing, your childhood is too strong. Yeah. That's the reality that you don't get to see right now. Yeah. And honestly, it only comes with the experience. Like, I don't know if I could have this conversation with you in the first five years of my practice with Gina, right? I would have been in this ideology of like, no, you just do this. And I've seen it. Like I told you earlier in my chiropractic practice, I was working with a lot of pregnant women at the time, pediatric chiropractic. And so, you know how many women want to have a natural home birth with a midwife and a doula, right? But then the moment things get kind of scary, some people is like, I know what I said I wanted, but right now I need to be in hospital. Well, guess what? They need to be in hospital. You see what I'm saying? Like there is no ideology. Well, no, according to natural birthing processes for that person, like I just described, if in their mind, there's 40, 30, 25 years of fear around not having a hospital birth, it has to be relevant to them. Who are we to say like, no, 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 you need to have it here. If you're more comfortable in the hospital, great. You're going to have a great delivery maybe for you in the hospital. This woman who wants no part of the hospital and feels so much more comfortable at home is going to have an easier delivery at home. You yeah. can't force it either yeah. way. Right? Oh, this is so, so good. I'm so glad you're talking about this stuff because I have personally encountered this. I know friends and family who have encountered this where it's so real. Like, yes, for the last X amount of years, I have this mindset of holistic health, right? But And now I know about GNM and I want to do everything according to like this trust in my body. But you're right. If I have all these y- prior years of conditioning or even present day conditioning still happening where you get the family or the parent who's like in your face and in your ear saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they're instilling their fears into you it's really hard sometimes to stay true to what you say you want today because what you want today is very real, but sometimes conditioning is strong. And if you stay so gripped, like if you grip so strongly to like, no, I got to do this naturally, I got to do this naturally, but you're literally riddled with fear. Now that's where these additional conflicts could potentially come into play. The Mm -hmm. flip side too, though, is that then sometimes what I've noticed come up for me, and I always think if it's happened for me, it's happened to other people, is choosing the medication, choosing the medical route, and then feeling loads of guilt Mm -hmm. because I wanted so badly to do it this way. And now here Mm -hmm. I am going over here and I have this guilt attached or now a new fear of, oh, if I take this antibiotic, now I'm blocking my healing phase and I'm actually not healing, but I'm so afraid if I don't take it, I'm going to die. So it can be a very complex situation to navigate through. Which is why it comes down to Mm self-awareness, body awareness, trusting the body, trusting yourself, trusting your pack. Like to me, that's at the core of this because when you achieve that level of trust, When you start to become so self-aware that you know exactly what your body needs at this moment in time, it's almost an intuitive process. It's not an intellectual one. Then you're, you're always going to make the right decision for you. And to me, I like to see that as the kind of GNM is the catalyst to get to that because I feel that GNM is so valuable in that it really puts you in touch. As I said, you get the symptom. Oh, this is what that symptom means. It puts you in touch with that subconscious perspective. And as you do this and you become more in touch with the subconscious perspective, you start to learn about yourself more, Mm -hmm. right? You start to understand your body better. And as you start to understand your body better, you learn about yourself more. Now you can trust your body more. Now you can trust yourself more. And so they kind of go together. And I really find like the beauty of these things is like, I don't know, the things I just mentioned are available to everyone, right? Like you don't have to wait in line, go to a certain person, spend a lot of money to apply the things that I just mentioned. And I really feel that that's one of the amazing side effects of knowing about GNM is that you get to work on those areas so that it builds your level of self-awareness, body awareness, and trust 
the next biological program, then the next one, then the next one. Mm -hmm. But you're right. You know, you hear that from mothers too, that they had their birth plan, had everything laid out, and then they had to get an emergency C-section. They're in the hospital and they're crying about it and they're upset and they feel guilty that they failed in somehow, right? So again, you've got to work through that. It goes back to those underlying fears. Why is that a concern? Is it that I'm going to die? Or is it that if I failed to have it naturally, if I failed to heal naturally, I'm going to be rejected, abandoned, and alone? So going back to those two things, how do you see that that's not true in the world? No matter what I decide to do regarding my treatment or therapy, by the end of my life, half the people are going to love me no matter what, half the people aren't going to care. Yeah. So then you kind of get that out of the equation and then you become able to make a decision that's pure to you. That's yeah. organic for who you are at this moment, right? Because you got to remember that these are moment to moment situations and scenarios. Things could be very different next month or in yep. six months, right? But right now, here's what I need to do. And I, I really feel like not enough people are talking about giving the patient that level of empowerment. Right? Because I get it. Most of us were indoctrinated to give the power to an expert. I have these degrees, so you don't know anything about the body child. Did you dissect any cadavers? No. So let me tell you what your body needs. We've all grown up in that indoctrination. So GM is now saying like, no, 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 your body has everything that it needs. You don't need an expert with these degrees. You can figure yourself out based on understanding the map and the language of the body and then understanding yourself. And then your willingness to change the way you look at the world. Great. So again, that doesn't mean it's easy, yeah. but it at least sets you up that you could truly be empowered. And that's why I really believe GNM is such a threat because you start to look at health now. It's something within you. It's something available to all like sunlight, like oxygen, like clean water, like your ability to heal. <laughs> like you, you don't need much if you really understand this at its core your body's already healed, knows how to heal naturally. You just have to understand what are your particular perspectives in this existence that you need to work on so you can continue to grow. Mm, I love that. Okay. I have an interesting question. So it's kind of like shifting gears for a moment here. Mm -hmm. So we know, I'm going to use the example for the sake of ease, the indigestible morsel conflict. So we know the indigestible morsel conflict can create a host of different various symptoms. You can have Crohn's disease, colitis, you know, ulcer stuff. You could get diagnosed with IBS. You can have diarrhea, explosive diarrhea. Like there's all these different things, but you could also have stomach cancer and there's all these varying degrees, but it's all from one type of conflict. From your experience, what dictates the severity or intensity of like what that becomes? Like how does one person end up with just say Crohn's or colitis for 20 years versus somebody else who ends up with like a severe stomach cancer? Well, again, I think the easy answer is that it's based on that person's subconscious perspective of the intensity of that experience. And what contributes to that? I think there's many variables that have to line up, many circumstances that line up that make you susceptible to experiencing that DHS as much more severe than if these two or three variables did not line up that particular week or that particular month. So for example, your cat died, your boyfriend breaks up with you, and then your parents want a divorce, and then somebody cuts in front of you at the line at the grocery store. Well, then that's going to create such a bigger potential DHS that moment because these other circumstances line up perfectly to make you vulnerable to that versus any other month, any other week that none of these other issues show up. Somebody cuts in front of you, you get annoyed by it. You have some mild stomach pain, diarrhea. Like, do you see what I'm saying? How Mm -hmm. part of the intensity of the diagnosis often is based on that person's subconscious experience of the intensity of that unexpected event. Mm -hmm. And like I said, certain things, circumstances just happen to line up to make you susceptible at that moment. That's why even with my knowledge of GNM for the last 15 years, I don't know what circumstances line up next week or next month that then when I experience an unexpected event, it makes me susceptible to that, right? There is no way of knowing. But if I'm aware because of the self-awareness, body awareness, I will hopefully pick up these disruptions in my natural rhythm between now and then so that I'm already downgrading and you know minimizing anything that's bothering me or at least exploring why that's affecting me the way it is, right? Mm. So that's one explanation. The other is just sometimes. It's the medical 
idea of giving a diagnosis to different things, right? Like that's really a lot of the times it comes down to these umbrella diagnoses. Like the medical system, the medical model, the conventional system is based on coming up with a diagnosis so we can enter you into a protocol so we can determine like which protocol fits what you're dealing with. So in that model, we need a diagnosis. And unfortunately, because there is no understanding of the third biological law, right? This embryological connection between organs, a lot of the current model of health is not even considering this idea that like it's the embryology that determines why it's affecting that organ, what conflict it is. So we're at the mercy of like the astuteness of the radiologist or the medical doctor to say like, oh no, you don't have this, you have this, which is much more serious. So sometimes it's not even your intensity experience, it's just a matter of like how astute is that person to be very diligent in finding a cancer versus calling it something else, right? So it just depends. And there's you're kind of at the mercy of whoever's reading that diagnostic test. So those are really, in my mind, the answers to that question that it's yeah. your intensity experience or it just happens to be like kind of bad luck or good luck, depending on whoever's reading your diagnostic test and what they want to put as a diagnosis for you. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So there is thought that we can be actually triggered by our, our dream state, like while we're sleeping, like dreams can actually become triggers. I find this so challenging because I can't particularly control my dreams. Like, what are your thoughts around this? And how do we navigate that if we're finding that we often wake up activated or triggered from our dream state? Well, first of all, I definitely think you can get triggered by what you happen to be dreaming, right? Like you can be dreaming that you're falling from a building or your daughter's falling from a building and you couldn't grab them and that triggers this fear. And then you wake up having an asthma attack or a coughing fit, right? So it's very direct. Like I was sleeping, I woke up, I couldn't stop coughing. So there was a scare. Well, I had this dream, like my daughter fell off a building. I couldn't grab her and she was falling to her death. So, okay. But those symptoms tend to be short. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like they'll tend to be like, unless you associate a reason why you had that dream. See? So now, Again, this is what's great about GNM, right? It's super simple, straightforward. Like if you're an engineer of mine, like, oh, this cause and effect makes sense. But humans are complicated. We're not so simple. So that dream to me could just be like, that's weird. I don't know. I think I watched a movie where, you know, somebody was falling out of a building. That's why I had that dream. Okay, I have a cough, coughing fit, and then it's done. You may think of that dream and say like, oh my gosh, it's because my daughter falling represents that she's falling out of favor with me because I moved her from this program that she's no longer with her friends. And so every time she gets upset that she can't see that friend, it's me feeling guilty. And it's like the way I felt when she was dying in my dream. If you connect it to that, you can imagine you're creating a track that every time your daughter gets upset or every time you say no to your daughter, you're going to have a coughing fit. See what I mean? Like that, like, I don't know. That's just an example. But that's the level of complexity that people, humans, and their minds and their associations, that's what we do. Mm. So this is why, like, sure, I think you definitely can get symptoms based on a very lucid dream that felt very real and then you wake up from it. If there's no association, like, that was weird. Okay, you get the symptoms and then it's done. You know, some people will be like, well, as a kid, I used to have a friend that we'd like analyze our dreams and we'd get the dream book and like, look at all what it means. You could create tracks because of that though. So then now you can have, depending on what you come up with, right? This is why, even though it starts off very simple, it can get very complex depending on what you read, how you look into it, what other knowledge you bring into why that happened that particular night why you have that kind of dream, why it becomes a recurring dream. And then you would have symptoms that now become chronic mm -hmm. that could be tied to that. So it just depends. This is what to me makes working with GNM super fun and exciting, right? Because there is no cookie cutter. Like, I don't know what kind of conversation I'm going to have with somebody. I can bring nothing to that initial visit. I can just go based on where they are. And like, why would you associate it with that? Okay. That's interesting. Like, you know, why do you think this has to do with your daughter? 
Why do you have that cough every time you say no to your daughter? What's that about? And then it will get revealed in that conversation. So because I have this kind of like broad perspective that I'm ready to kind of go with where the person is willing to go in terms of their interpretation of why they see things that way. That's partly why I feel very confident that like, if you allow that and you're not so rigid in like, well, it has to fit only this model. Like, I think that's why I tend to get the kind of the results. And I think why people tend to have positive benefit of the consultations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So speaking of triggers, we talked about like emotional triggers, right? Mm -hmm. But we also know there's, you've briefly mentioned several times now, tracks and triggers, So we also know that the brain takes like snapshots in moments of conflict and it perceives things as threatening that aren't necessarily a threat, which can be like a color, a space, a sound, a person, a place, a thing, a food, a smell. And sometimes I know that when people are aware of what these triggers are, it can be easy to retrain your brain to not perceive these things as a threat and like to kind of disentangle them from the DHS. But a lot of times we aren't even aware of what's triggering us. Mm -hmm. Not emotional, but like something outside of us that the brain is perceiving as a threat. If I'm not even aware of what it is, how do I untangle it? Well, this goes back to those core principles that I talked about regarding the self-awareness, the body awareness, and the trust, right? So number one, you have to trust that your body's only giving you a symptom because you step on a track. So if you believe and you understand that your digestive issue has to do with that ex-partner that's no longer in your life, right? But there's potential tracks that remind you of that relationship. And you're somewhere with a friend enjoying yourself at a park and in your stomach, digestive issues like, what the heck? Like, why am I having to run to the bathroom now? Like, I know that that only happens when I get triggered regarding my ex. Like, but why am I getting triggered here? Like, I'm not, we're not talking about my ex. Like, there's nothing about my ex here. So. In that moment where you get the symptom, which is going to tell you, you stepped on a track and you know, there's no direct reminder, right? Like there's nothing that has to do with this ex-partner. Well, then you've got to now look because you trust your body, something about this environment, something about where we are, something about what we talked about must be associated with that ex. See, and this is where if you're self-aware and you trust, then now you this is where it becomes intuitive, right? It's like word association. It's like, if you're there with a friend, you're like, okay, did you guys come here before? Is this a place that's relevant to you? Like in terms of environment or location, was there anything that you were thinking about before their stomach issues came up that like, it was just a thought like for a brief second, because it could be as random as like, you're talking, sipping your coffee, you see somebody, you're like, oh my gosh, that guy looks like my ex's brother. And then you go back to your conversation and then that's the track. So- do you see what I'm saying? It's there's no again like cookie cutter. It's very much intuitive, but it's you not letting that go. You cannot let it go and start going somewhere else. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, no, 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 no. I know that my symptom is directly tried to because I've already done the work. It has to do with that ex, it has to do with that relationship, and any tracks related to that relationship. So if you can't find something obvious. You don't now start to make it about, oh, it must have been this thing that I ate yesterday. Or, you know, you don't do that, right? You do not let it go. You don't start saying like, oh, maybe it's like a new issue. Like maybe it has to do with you. Like, no, no, no. If you have established it, you stick to it. You don't let it go. And then you now scan and scan your mind prior to that track. Because when it's a track, it's a condensed biological process. You get triggered and then you go through the healing phase. So you only notice the healing phase, right? So it's going to be within, I don't know, seconds, minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes of the symptom, something in your environment. And my thing is because you're looking and scanning in this way, something pops up to you in your mind like, oh, you know what? Actually, you know, that's so funny because I was just thinking, what's the date today? So-and-so, that's our anniversary. Like something seemingly subtle like that could be enough. So it's crazy, right? But to me, that's when you trust the body. It will not give you a symptom randomly. When that symptom is there, you definitely step on the track. It's either going to be very obvious or it's going to be subtle. But when it's subtle, you're right. It's obviously it's going to be more challenging. But again, it's an intuitive thing. Scan, go through your mind, literally 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes from when the symptom flared up. And you don't let it go. You've got to pick something. 
my thing is pick something. Just be like, okay, I think it's this. Okay, connect it to that. Let that go. And then see what happens moving forward. Okay. I guess just from a general perspective, what thoughts or insights do you have for anyone who's listening to this who would like this kind of all might be new for them and they don't even know where to begin, but they want to start exploring their symptoms from this perspective? Yes. So first of all, if you're listening to this and it's the first time, like welcome to GNM and you're in for one heck of a ride. <laughs> as, as anybody that's already been studying for a while will attest to. But I really think the first thing you want to look at is, you know, in my mind, you've got to visit like the learninggnm.com website. You've got to go to my, I have uh, YouTube videos, like over a hundred of them. Like you've got to kind of get your feet wet. You kind of have to just jump right in. Like watch some videos, watch some explanations, sign up for some webinars and just really go and immerse yourself in the information and then sit with it, right? Like my biggest advice is to study, listen, participate, and then write down your questions. Like literally poke holes in it, find ways that it doesn't apply, question it, like really be critical of what you're hearing. Because that's kind of what I did, right? Back then there was no website. It was a four day course. I followed Carolina, who is now a colleague of mine, like from Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and Austria for two and a half years, taking the same courses, writing them down. It was like manual, like wrote them down. I still got the thick books. But then when I'd go home, I would write down all the questions. What about this? Well, what about this? Well, how does Gina explain this? Well, what about this condition? And I would then go to the next course and I would have to ask it in between breaks or at lunch. And Carolina is very adamant. Like if it's a break, I don't want to talk about GNM. So I had to find ways to get to her to get those questions answered. But that's what I would suggest. Like literally just jump in, don't overthink it. But once you watch a video, a webinar or something, or, or you read something on the website, definitely deconstruct it, challenge it, criticize it, write those questions down and find a way to get them answered whether that's me or anybody else in the genome community, get them answered. Because in my mind, you have to go deep with this information, right? This is about depth. This is about growing the roots that when your knowledge and confidence and certainty and security in this information is solid, like it's like bring on the questions, right? And, and I think there cannot be a question that you did not ask yourself. And that's really what built my confidence over the years because I asked a lot of questions, right? It was hard for me as a chiropractor to really look at it from this perspective. It was not easy. It was a lot of like sleepless nights, a lot of like two, three o'clock in the morning, scouring the internet, looking for information. Like it was not easy. And then patients coming in, like, what are you talking about? I didn't come here to talk about my mother. I came here to get adjusted. And like, so there was a lot of those challenges early on, but it was great. I needed to go through that to build the level of confidence that I have now. And so that's what I would encourage people to do, that this is not about going wide with the information, like sharing it with as many people as possible, but then they have such small depth of information and knowledge that like they get swept away the moment somebody questions something, right? Instead, you go deep with people that are willing to put in the work, willing to question it and get those questions answered. I love it. Yeah, it's the best way. Just like play devil's advocate, challenge things, ask the questions, because then you get to deeper truths. It's the only way. It's the yeah. only way to get this and the only way to build your confidence because when you now want to teach or share it, there's nothing that someone sitting in that class is not going to ask that you've already asked. So, right. so again, that's great, right? Because now you have an answer and now you feel pretty good about that. So, so I really think that's the way to study it with a critical mindset. Like don't take what I'm saying <laughs> at face value. Don't take what anybody says at face value as truth. Okay, listen to it, process it, but question it and then get those questions answered. I love it. What are the services that you're currently offering to support people in the community and healing? So the main thing really is I do my online consult. So I've got my calendar. I mean, it's the challenge is that I have limited time. I spend anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes in my consultations. So I may not have an opening till, I don't know, right now, I think people are booking in April, right? Just because I have limited time to do these online consults. That's what I do pretty much four days of the week, four and a half days of the week. And then for one to two days of the week, I'm in the clinic. So I still see people in the clinic, whether that's, again, five, 10% of like pure chiropractic work, not talking GNM. 
I'd say like 90%, 95% of what I see people that come to me, it's a GNM conversation, figuring out the emotional component. And then we do the chiropractic, whatever they need at that moment. So those are the two things I'm doing now. I'm doing my webinars every month where I have a free webinar on Thursday evenings that are recorded. It's on special topics. I put out the recording with my newsletter so people can sign up with my newsletter to get access to that. And Carolina and I have Genome Online meetings that we do once a month on a Saturday for two hours. Those are like $30 Canadian for the two hours where people get to ask questions and it's a meeting. So I present a couple of cases and then people that are there bring any case studies or questions that they have. And we have a discussion on that specific topic. So we do those once a month. So those are pretty much the things I'm doing right now. It's keeping me busy. I love it. And how can people connect with you? So definitely check out my Instagram page. I've got to post a little bit more on there and my YouTube channel, which I haven't posted in like five years, but there's a ton of videos on there. And you could go to my website to sign up on my mailing list. So it's dralvindeleon.com. I'm sure Chaz will put it out here so that you guys can check it out in the show notes or something. But otherwise, no, I hope this was a valuable conversation. I uh, hope it's going to help a lot of people moving forward with their uh, journey of learning more about GNM. Yeah, I have no doubts that it will. I know that it already helped me. So if it helps me, it helps in someone else. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. It's so fun to listen to you talk. And I like your perspective. I like how you are able to elaborate on things. And I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Awesome, Chaz. Pleasure. And look forward to uh, hearing from many of you guys down the road if you have any questions. All right. Friends, that is a wrap. I have a couple more episodes already lined up. So make sure that you click subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next new episode on the list. I love you all dearly. I've missed you. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know what's going well. Let me know where you're at in your healing journey. DM me, email me, voice memo me on my website. There's so many ways to get in touch with me. WhatsApp me, any means of communication. I just love hearing from you guys. It always just really honestly melts my heart. It's so good to connect and just hear from you all out there and just see where you're at in your journey. So anytime you feel compelled to share, I'm here to listen. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, I found my light, the fruit became the